Section 41 of After Dark This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. After Dark by Wilkie Collins The Professor's Story of the Yellow Mask Part Second, Chapter Three before the servant could get to the priest's lodgings, a visitor had applied there for admission, and had been immediately received by Father Rocco himself. This favoured guest was a little man, very sprucely and neatly dressed, and oppressively polite in his manner. He bowed when he first sat down, he bowed when he answered the usual inquiries about his health, and he bowed, for the third time, when Father Rocco asked what had brought him from Florence. "'Rather an awkward business,' replied the little man, recovering himself uneasily after his third bow. "'The dressmaker, named Nanina, whom you placed under my wife's protection about a year ago—' "'What of her?' inquired the priest eagerly. "'I regret to say she has left us, with her child sister, and their very disagreeable dog that growls at everybody. "'When did they go?' "'Only yesterday. I came here at once to tell you—' as you were so very particular in recommending us to take care of her. It is not our fault that she has gone. My wife was kindness itself to her, and I always treated her like a duchess. I bought dinner mats of her sister. I even put up with the thieving and growling of the disagreeable dog. Where have they gone to? Have you found out that? I have found out, by application at the passport office, that they have not left Florence, but what particular part of the city they have removed to, I have not yet had time to discover. And pray, why did they leave you in the first place? Nanina is not a girl to do anything without a reason. She must have had some cause for going away. What was it? The little man hesitated and made a fourth bow. You remember your private instructions to my wife and myself when you first brought Nanina to our house? He said, looking away rather uneasily while he spoke. Yes, you were to watch her, but to take care that she did not suspect you. It was just possible, at that time, that she might try to get back to Pisa without my knowing it, and everything depended on her remaining at Florence. I think, now, that I did wrong to distrust her, but it was of the last importance to provide against all possibilities, and to abstain from putting too much faith in my own good opinion of the girl. For these reasons, I certainly did instruct you to watch her privately. So far you are quite right, and I have nothing to complain of. Go on. You remember, resumed the little man, that the first consequence of our following your instructions was a discovery, which we immediately communicated to you, that she was secretly learning to write? Yes, and I also remember sending you word not to show that you knew what she was doing, but to wait and see if she turned her knowledge of writing to account and took or sent any letters to the post. You informed me, in your regular monthly report, that she never did anything of the kind. Never, until three days ago, and then she was traced from her room in my house to the post office with a letter, which she dropped into the box. And the address of which you discovered before she took it from your house? Unfortunately, I did not, answered the little man reddening and looking askance at the priest, as if he expected to receive a severe reprimand. But Father Rocco said nothing. He was thinking, who could she have written to? If to Fabio, why should she have waited for months and months after she had learned how to use her pen before sending him a letter? If not to Fabio, to what other person could she have written? I regret not discovering the address, regret it most deeply, said the little man, with a low bow of apology. "'It is too late for regret,' said Father Rocco coldly. "'Tell me how she came to leave your house. I have not heard that yet. Be as brief as you can. I expect to be called every moment to the bedside of a near and dear relation who is suffering from a severe illness. You shall have all my attention, but you must ask it for as short a time as possible. I will be briefness itself. In the first place, you must know that I have, or rather had, an idle, unscrupulous rascal of an apprentice in my business. The priest pursed up his mouth contemptuously. In the second place, this same good-for-nothing fellow 
had the impertinence to fall in love with Nanina. Father Rocco started, and listened eagerly. But I must do the girl the justice to say that she never gave him the slightest encouragement, and that, whenever he ventured to speak to her, she always quietly, but very decidedly, repelled him. A good girl, said Father Rocco. I have always said she was a good girl. It was a mistake on my part ever to have distrusted her. Among the other offences, continued the little man, of which I now find my scoundrel of an apprentice to have been guilty, was the enormity of picking the lock of my desk and prying into my private papers. You ought not to have had any. Private papers should always be burned papers. They shall be for the future. I will take good care of that. Were any of my letters to you about Nanina among these private papers? Unfortunately, they were. Pray, pray, excuse my want of caution this time. It shall never happen again. Go on. Such imprudence as yours can never be excused. It can only be provided against for the future. I suppose the apprentice showed my letters to the girl? I infer as much. Though why he should do so... Simpleton! Did you not say that he was in love with her, as you term it, and that he got no encouragement? Yes, I said that, and I know it to be true. Well, was it not his interest, being unable to make any impression on the girl's fancy, to establish some claim to her gratitude, and try if he could not win her that way? By showing her my letters, he would make her indebted to him for knowing that she was watched in your house. But this is not the matter in question now. You say you infer that she had seen my letters. On what grounds? On the strength of this bit of paper, answered the little man, ruefully producing a note from his pocket. She must have had your letter shown to her soon after putting her own letter into the post. For, on the evening of the same day, when I went up into her room, I found that she and her sister and the disagreeable dog had all gone, and observed this note laid on the table. Father Rocco took the note, and read these lines. I have just discovered that I have been watched and suspected ever since my stay under your roof. It is impossible that I can remain another night in the house of a spy. I go with my sister. We owe you nothing, and we are free to live honestly where we please. If you see Father Rocco, tell him that I can forgive his distrust of me, but that I can never forget it. I who had full faith in him, had a right to expect that he should have full faith in me. It was always an encouragement to me to think of him as a father and a friend. I have lost that encouragement forever, and it was the last I had left to me. Nanina The priest rose from his seat as he handed the note back, and the visitor immediately followed his example. We must remedy this misfortune as best we may, he said with a sigh. Are you ready to go back to Florence tomorrow? The little man bowed again. Find out where she is, and ascertain if she wants for anything, and if she is living in a safe place. Say nothing about me, and make no attempt to induce her to return to your house. Simply let me know what you discover. The poor child has a spirit that no ordinary people would suspect in her. She must be soothed and treated tenderly, and we shall manage her yet. No mistakes, mind, this time. Do just what I tell you, and do no more. Have you anything else to say to me? The little man shook his head and shrugged his shoulders. Good night, then, said the priest. Good night, said the little man, slipping through the door that was held open for him with the politest alacrity. This is vexatious, said Father Rocco, taking a turn or two in the study after his visitor had gone. It was bad to have done the child an injustice. It is worse to have been found out. There is nothing for it now but to wait till I know where she is. I like her, and I like that note she left behind her. It is bravely, delicately, and honestly written. A good girl. A very good girl indeed. He walked to the window, breathed the fresh air for a few moments, and quietly dismissed the subject from his mind. When he returned to the table, he had no thoughts for anyone but his sick niece. It seems strange he said, that I have had no message about her yet. Perhaps Luca has heard something. It may be well if I go to the studio at once to find out. He took up his hat and went to the door. Just as he opened it, 
Fabio's servant confronted him on the threshold. "'I am sent to summon you to the palace,' said the man. "'The doctors have given up all hope.' Father Rocco turned deadly pale and drew back a step. "'Have you told my brother of this?' he asked. "'I was just on my way to the studio,' answered the servant. "'I will go there instead of you and break the bad news to him,' said the priest. They descended the stairs in silence. Just as they were about to separate at the street door, Father Rocco stopped the servant. "'How is the child?' he asked, with a sudden eagerness and impatience, that the man looked quite startled as he answered that the child was perfectly well. "'There is some consolation in that,' said Father Rocco, walking away, and speaking partly to the servant, partly to himself. "'My caution has misled me,' he continued, pausing thoughtfully when he was left alone in the roadway. "'I should have risked using the mother's influence sooner to procure the righteous restitution. All hope of compassing it now rests on the life of the child.' Infant as she is, her father's ill-gotten wealth may yet be gathered back to the church by her hands. He proceeded rapidly on his way to the studio, until he reached the riverside and drew close to the bridge which it was necessary to cross in order to get to his brother's house. Here he stopped abruptly, as if struck by a sudden idea. The moon had just risen, and her light, streaming across the river, fell full upon his face as he stood by the parapet wall that led up to the bridge. He was so lost in thought that he did not hear the conversation of two ladies who were advancing along the pathway close behind him. As they brushed by him, the taller of the two turned round and looked back at his face. "'Father Rocco!' exclaimed the lady, stopping. "'Donna Brigida!' cried the priest, looking surprised at first, but recovering himself directly and bowing with his usual quiet politeness. "'Pardon me if I thank you for honouring me by renewing our acquaintance, and then pass on to my brother's studio.' A heavy affliction is likely to befall us, and I go to prepare him for it. "'You refer to the dangerous illness of your niece?' said Brigida. "'I heard of it this evening. Let us hope that your fears are exaggerated, and that we may yet meet under less distressing circumstances. I have no present intention of leaving Pisa for some time, and I shall always be glad to thank Father Rocco for the politeness and consideration which he showed to me under delicate circumstances a year ago.' With these words she curtsied deferentially, and moved away to rejoin her friend. The priest observed that Mademoiselle Virginie lingered rather near, as if anxious to catch a few words of the conversation between Brigida and himself. Seeing this, he, in his turn, listened as the two women slowly walked away together, and heard the Italian say to her companion, "'Virginie, I will lay you the price of a new dress that Fabio Descoli marries again.' Father Rocco started when she said those words as if he had trodden on fire. "'My thought!' he whispered nervously to himself. "'My thought at the moment when she spoke to me. "'Marry again! "'Another wife over whom I should have no influence? "'Other children whose education would not be confided to me? "'What would become, then, of the restitution that I have hoped for, "'wrought for, prayed for?' "'He stopped and looked fixedly at the sky above him. "'The bridge was deserted.' His black figure rose up erect, motionless, and spectral, with the white still light falling solemnly all around it. Standing so for some minutes, his first movement was to drop his hand angrily on the parapet of the bridge. He then turned round slowly in the direction by which the two women had walked away. "'Donna Brigida," he said, "'I will lay you the price of fifty new dresses that Fabio Descoli never marries again.' He set his face once more toward the studio, and walked on without stopping, until he arrived at the master sculptor's door. "'Marry again,' he thought to himself as he rang the bell. "'Donna Brigida, was your first failure not enough for you? Are you going to try a second time?' Luca Lomi himself opened the door. He drew Father Rocco hurriedly into the studio, toward a single lamp burning on a stand near the partition between the two rooms. "'Have you heard anything of our poor child?' he asked. Tell me the truth, tell me the truth at once. Hush, compose yourself, I have heard, said Father Rocco in low, mournful tones. Luca tightened his hold on the priest's arm, and looked into his face with breathless, speechless eagerness. Compose yourself, repeated Father Rocco. Compose yourself to hear the worst. My poor Luca, the doctors have given up all hope. Luca dropped his brother's arm with a groan of despair. Oh, Magdalena, my child, my only child! 
reiterating these words again and again. He leaned his head against the partition and burst into tears. Sordid and coarse as his nature was, he really loved his daughter. All the heart he had was in his statues and in her. After the first burst of his grief was exhausted, he was recalled to himself by a sensation as if some change had taken place in the lighting of the studio. He looked up directly, and dimly discerned the priest standing far down at the end of the room nearest the door, with a lamp in his hand, eagerly looking at something. Rocco, he exclaimed. Rocco, why have you taken the lamp away? What are you doing there? There was no movement and no answer. Luca advanced a step or two and called again. Rocco, what are you doing there? The priest heard this time, and came suddenly toward his brother with the lamp in his hand, so suddenly that Luca started. What is it? he asked in astonishment. "'Gracious God, Rocco! How pale you are!' Still the priest never said a word. He put the lamp down on the nearest table. Luca observed that his hand shook. He had never seen his brother violently agitated before. When Rocco had announced, but a few minutes ago, that Madalena's life was despaired of, it was in a voice which, though sorrowful, was perfectly calm. What was the meaning of this sudden panic, this strange, silent terror?' The priest observed that his brother was looking at him earnestly. Come, he said in a faint whisper. Come to her bedside. We have no time to lose. Get your hat, and leave it to me to put out the lamp. He hurriedly extinguished the light while he spoke. They went down the studio side by side toward the door. The moonlight streamed through the window full on the place where the priest had been standing alone with the lamp in his hand. As they passed it, Luca felt his brother tremble, and saw him turn away his head. Two hours later, Fabio de Scoli and his wife were separated in this world forever, and the servants of the palace were anticipating in whispers the order of their mistress's funeral procession to the burial ground of the Campo Santo. End of section 41 Recording by Todd Section 42 of After Dark this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Warren Cotty, Gurney, Illinois. After Dark by Wilkie Collins. The Professor's Story of the Yellow Mask. Part Third, Chapter One. About eight months after the Countess di Ascoli had been laid in her grave at the Campo Santo, two reports were circulated through the gay world of Pisa, which excited curiosity and awakened expectation everywhere. The first report announced that a grand mask ball was to be given at the Melani Palace, to celebrate the day on which the heir of the house attained his majority. All the friends of the family were delighted at the prospect of this festival, for the old Marquis Melani had the reputation of being one of the most hospitable and, at the same time, one of the most eccentric men in Pisa. Everyone expected, therefore, that he would secure for the entertainment of his guests, if he really gave the ball, the most whimsical novelties in the way of masks, dances, and amusements generally that had ever been seen the second report was that the rich widower fabio di ascoli was on the point of returning to pisa after having improved his health and spirits by travelling in foreign countries and that he might be expected to appear again in society for the first time since the death of his wife at the mask ball which was to be given in the malani palace this announcement excited special interest among the young ladies of Pisa. Fabio had only reached his thirtieth year, and it was universally agreed that his return to society in his native city could indicate nothing more, certainly, than his desire to find a second mother for his infant child. All the single ladies would now have been ready to bet, as confidently as Brigitta had offered to bet eight months before, that Fabio di Ascoli would marry again. For once in a way, report turned out to be true, in both the cases just mentioned. 
invitations were actually issued from the melanie palace and fabio returned from abroad to his home on the arno in settling all the arrangements connected with his masked ball the marquis melanie showed that he was determined not only to deserve but to increase his reputation for oddity he invented the most extravagant disguises to be worn by some of his more intimate friends he arranged grotesque dances to be performed at stated periods of the evening by professional buffoons hired from florence he composed a toy symphony which included solos on every noisy plaything at that time manufactured for children's use and not content with thus avoiding the beaten track in preparing the entertainments at the ball he determined also to show decided originality even in selecting the attendants who were to wait on the company other people in his rank of life were accustomed to employ their own and hired footmen for this purpose the marquis resolved that his attendants should be composed of young women only that two of his rooms should be fitted up as arcadian bowers and that all the prettiest girls in pisa should be placed in them to preside over the refreshments dressed in accordance with the mock classical taste of the period as shepherdesses of the time of virgil the only defect of this brilliantly new idea was the difficulty of executing it the marquis had expressly ordered that not fewer than thirty shepherdesses were to be engaged fifteen for each bower it would have been easy to find double this number in pisa if beauty had been the only quality required in the attendant damsels but it was also absolutely necessary for the security of the marquis's gold and silver plate that the shepherdesses should possess besides good looks the very homely recommendation of a fair character this last qualification proved it is sad to say to be the one small merit which the majority of the ladies willing to accept engagements at the palace did not possess day after day passed on and the marquis's steward only found more and more difficulty in obtaining the appointed number of trustworthy beauties at last his resources failed him altogether and he appeared in his master's presence about a week before the night of the ball to make the humiliating acknowledgment that he was entirely at his wit's end the total number of fair shepherdesses with fair characters whom he had been able to engage amounted only to twenty-three nonsense cried the marquis irritably as soon as the steward had made his confession i told you to get thirty girls and thirty i mean to have what's the use of shaking your head when all their dresses are ordered thirty tunics thirty wreaths thirty pairs of sandals and silk stockings thirty crooks you scoundrel and you have the impudence to offer me only twenty-three hands to hold them not a word i won't hear a word get me thirty girls or lose your place the marquis roared out this last terrible sentence at the top of his voice and pointed peremptorily to the door the steward knew his master too well to remonstrate he took his hat and cane and went out it was useless to look through the ranks of rejected volunteers again there was not the slightest hope in that quarter the only chance left was to call on all his friends in pisa who had daughters out at service and to try what he could accomplish by bribery and persuasion that way after a whole day occupied in solicitations promises and patient smoothing down of innumerable difficulties the result of his efforts in the new direction was an accession of six more shepherdesses this brought him on bravely from twenty-three to twenty-nine and left him at last with only one anxiety where was he now to find shepherdess number thirty he mentally asked himself that important question as he entered a shady by-street in the neighborhood of the campo santo on his way back to the melani palace sauntering slowly along in the middle of the road and fanning himself with his handkerchief after the oppressive exertions of the day he passed a young girl who was standing at the street door of one of the houses apparently waiting for somebody to join her before she entered the building body of bacchus exclaimed the steward 
using one of those old pagan ejaculations which survive in italy even to the present day there stands the prettiest girl i have seen yet if she would only be shepherdess number thirty i should go home to supper with my mind at ease i'll ask her at any rate nothing can be lost by asking and everything may be gained stop my dear he continued seeing the girl turn to go into the house as he approached her don't be afraid of me i am steward to the marquis maligny and well known in pisa as an eminently respectable man i have something to say to you which may be greatly for your benefit don't look surprised i am coming to the point at once do you want to earn a little money honestly of course you don't look as if you were very rich my child i am very poor and very much in want of some honest work to do answered the girl sadly then we shall suit each other to a nicety for i have work of the pleasantest kind to give you and plenty of money to pay for it but before we say anything more about that suppose you tell me first something about yourself who you are and so forth you know who i am already i am only a poor work-girl and my name is nanina i have nothing more sir to say about myself than that do you belong to pisa yes sir at least i did but i have been away for some time i was a year at florence employed in needlework all by yourself no sir with my little sister i was waiting for her when you came up have you ever done anything else but needlework never been out at service yes sir for the last eight months i have had a situation to wait on a lady at florence and my sister who is turned eleven sir and can make herself very useful was allowed to help in the nursery how came you to leave this situation the lady and her family were going to rome sir they would have taken me with them but they could not take my sister we are alone in the world and we never have been parted from each other and never shall be so i was obliged to leave the situation and here you are back at pisa with nothing to do i suppose nothing yet sir we only came back yesterday only yesterday you are a lucky girl let me tell you to have met with me i suppose you have somebody in the town who can speak to your character the landlady of the house can sir and who is she pray marta angrasani sir what the well-known sick nurse you could not possibly have a better recommendation child i remember her being employed at the maligny palace at the time of the marquis's last attack of gout but i never knew that she kept a lodging-house she and her daughter sir have owned this house longer than i can recollect my sister and i have lived in it since i was quite a little child and i had hoped we might be able to live here again but the top room we used to have is taken and the room to let lower down is far more i am afraid than we can afford how much is it nanina mentioned the weekly rent of the room in fear and trembling the steward burst out laughing suppose i offered you money enough to be able to take that room for a whole year at once he said nanina looked at him in speechless amazement suppose i offered you that continued the steward and suppose i only ask you in return to put on a fine dress and serve refreshments in a beautiful room to the company at the marquis malani's grand ball what should you say to that nanina said nothing she drew back a step or two and looked more bewildered than before you must have heard of the ball said the steward pompously the poorest people in pisa have heard of it it is the talk of the whole city still nanina made no answer to have replied truthfully she must have confessed that the talk of the whole city had now no interest for her the last news from pisa that had appealed to her sympathies was the news of the countess d'ascoli's death and of fabio's departure to travel in foreign countries since then she had heard nothing more of him she was as ignorant of his return to his native city as of all the reports connected with the marquis's ball something in her own heart some feeling which she had neither the desire nor the capacity to analyze had brought her back to pisa and to the old home which now connected itself with her tenderest recollections 
believing that fabio was still absent she felt that no ill motive could now be attributed to her return and she had not been able to resist the temptation of revisiting the scene that had been associated with the first great happiness as well as the first great sorrow of her life among all the poor people of pisa she was perhaps the very last whose curiosity could be awakened or whose attention could be attracted by the rumor of gaieties at the melani palace but she could not confess all this she could only listen with great humility and no small surprise while the steward in compassion for her ignorance and with the hope of tempting her into accepting his offered engagement described the arrangements of the approaching festival and dwelt fondly on the magnificence of the arcadian bowers and the beauty of the shepherdess's tunics as soon as he had done nanina ventured on the confession that she should feel rather nervous in a grand dress that did not belong to her and that she doubted very much her own capability of waiting properly on the great people at the ball the steward however would hear of no objections and called peremptorily for marta angersani to make the necessary statement as to nanina's character while this formality was being complied with to the steward's perfect satisfaction la biondella came in unaccompanied on this occasion by the usual companion of all her walks the learned poodle scaramuccia this is nanina's sister said the good-natured sick nurse taking the first opportunity of introducing la biondella to the great marquis's great man a very good industrious little girl and very clever at plating dinner mats in case his excellency should ever want any what have you done with the dog my dear i couldn't get him past the pork butchers three streets off replied la biondella he would sit down and look at the sausages i am more than half afraid he means to steal some of them a very pretty child said the steward patting la biondella on the cheek we ought to have her at the hall if his excellency should want a cupid or a youthful nymph or anything small and light in that way i shall come back and let you know in the meantime nanina consider yourself shepherdess number thirty and come to the housekeeper's room at the palace to try on your dress to-morrow nonsense don't talk to me about being afraid and awkward all you're wanted to do is to look pretty and your glass must have told you you could do that long ago remember the rent of the room my dear and don't stand in your light and your sister's does the little girl like sweetmeats of course she does well i promise you a whole box of sugar plums to take home for her if you will come and wait at the ball oh go to the ball nanina go to the ball cried la biondella clapping her hands of course she will go to the ball said the nurse she would be mad to throw away such an excellent chance nanina looked perplexed she hesitated a little then drew marta angersani aside into a corner and whispered this question to her do you think there will be any priests at the palace where the marquis lives heavens child what a thing to ask returned the nurse priests at a masked ball you might as well expect to find turks performing high mass in the cathedral but supposing you did meet with priests at the palace what then nothing said nanina constrainedly she turned pale and walked away as she spoke her great dread in returning to pisa was the dread of meeting with father rocco again she had never forgotten her first discovery at florence of his distrust of her the bare thought of seeing him any more after her faith in him had been shaken forever made her feel faint and sick at heart to-morrow in the housekeeper's room said the steward putting on his hat you will find your new dress all ready for you nanina courtesied and ventured on no more objections the prospect of securing a home for a whole year to come among people whom she knew reconciled her influenced as she was also by marta angrisani's advice and by her sister's anxiety for the promised present to brave the trial of appearing at the ball what a comfort to have it all settled at last said the steward as soon as he was out again in the street we shall see what the marquis says now 
if he doesn't apologize for calling me a scoundrel the moment he sets eyes on number thirty he is the most ungrateful nobleman that ever existed arriving in front of the palace the steward found workmen engaged in planning the external decorations and illuminations for the night of the ball a little crowd had already assembled to see the ladders raised and the scaffoldings put up he observed among them standing near the outskirts of the throng a lady who attracted his attention he was an ardent admirer of the fair sex by the beauty and symmetry of her figure while he lingered for a moment to look at her a shaggy poodle dog licking his chops as if he had just had something to eat trotted by stopped suddenly close to the lady sniffed suspiciously for an instant and then began to growl at her without the slightest apparent provocation the steward advanced politely with his stick to drive the dog away saw the lady start and heard her exclaim to herself amazedly you here you beast can nanina have come back to pisa the last exclamation gave the steward as a gallant man an excuse for speaking to the elegant stranger excuse me madam he said but i heard you mention the name of nanina may i ask whether you mean a pretty little work-girl who lives near the campo santo the same said the lady looking very much surprised and interested immediately it may be a gratification to you madam to know that she has just returned to pisa continued the steward politely and moreover that she is in a fair way to rise in the world i have just engaged her to wait at the marquis's grand ball and i need hardly to say under those circumstances that if she plays her cards properly her fortune is made the lady bowed looked at her informant very intently and thoughtfully for a moment then suddenly walked away without uttering a word a curious woman thought the steward entering the palace i must ask number thirty about her to-morrow end of section forty two Recording by Warren Cotty, Gurney, Illinois. Section 43 of After Dark. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Warren Cotty, Gurney, Illinois. After Dark by Wilkie Collins The Professor's Story of the Yellow Mask Part Third, Chapter Two The death of Maddalena Diascoli produced a complete change in the lives of her father and her uncle. After the first shock of the bereavement was over, Luca Lomi declared that it would be impossible for him to work in his studio again for some time to come at least after the death of the beloved daughter with whom every corner of it was now so sadly and closely associated he accordingly accepted an engagement to assist in restoring several newly discovered works of ancient sculpture at naples and set forth for that city leaving the care of his workrooms at pisa entirely to his brother on the master sculptor's departure father rocco caused the statues and busts to be carefully enveloped in linen cloths locked the studio doors and to the astonishment of all who knew of his former industry and dexterity as a sculptor never approached the place again his clerical duties he performed with the same assiduity as ever but he went out less than had been his custom hitherto to the houses of his friends his most regular visits were to the Ascoli Palace, to inquire at the porter's lodge after the health of Maddalena's child, who was always reported to be thriving admirably under the care of the best nurses that could be found in Pisa. As for any communications with his polite little friend from Florence, they had ceased months ago. The information speedily conveyed to him that Nanina was in the service of one of the most respectable ladies in the city, seemed to relieve any anxieties which he might otherwise have felt on her account he made no attempt to justify himself to her 
and only required that his over-courteous little visitor of former days should let him know whenever the girl might happen to leave her new situation. The admirers of Father Rocco, seeing the alteration in his life, and the increased quietness of his manner, said that, as he was growing older, he was getting more and more above the things of this world. His enemies, for even Father Rocco had them, did not scruple to assert that the change in him was decidedly for the worse, and that he belonged to the order of men who are most to be distrusted when they become most subdued. The priest himself paid no attention either to his eulogists or to his depreciators. Nothing disturbed the regularity and discipline of his daily habits, and vigilant scandal, though she sought often to surprise him, sought always in vain. Such was Father Rocco's life from the period of his niece's death to Fabio's return to Pisa. As a matter of course, the priest was one of the first to call at the palace and welcome the young nobleman back. What passed between them at this interview never was precisely known. But it was surmised readily enough that some misunderstanding had taken place, for Father Rocco did not repeat his visit. He made no complaints of Fabio, but simply stated that he had said something, intended for the young man's good, which had not been received in a right spirit, and that he thought it desirable to avoid the painful chance of any further collision by not presenting himself at the palace again for some little time. People were rather amazed at this. They would have been still more surprised if the subject of the masked ball had not just then occupied all their attention, and prevented their noticing it by another strange event in connection with the priest. Father Rocco, some weeks after the cessation of his intercourse with Fabio, returned one morning to his old way of life as a sculptor, and opened the long closed doors of his brother's studio. Luca Lomi's former workman, discovering this, applied to him immediately for employment, but were informed that their services would not be needed. Visitors called at the studio, but were always sent away again by the disappointing announcement that there was nothing new to show them. So the days passed on until Nanina left her situation and returned to Pisa. This circumstance was duly reported to Father Rocco by his correspondent at Florence. But, whether he was too much occupied among the statues, or whether it was one result of his cautious resolution never to expose himself unnecessarily to so much as the breath of detraction, he made no attempt to see Nanina, or even to justify himself toward her by writing her a letter. All his mornings continued to be spent alone in the studio, and all his afternoons to be occupied by his clerical duties, until the day before the masked ball at the Melanie Palace. Early on that day he covered over the statues, and locked the doors of the workrooms once more, then returned to his own lodgings, and did not go out again. One or two of his friends who wanted to see him were informed that he was not well enough to be able to receive them. If they had penetrated into his little study, and had seen him, they would have been easily satisfied that this was no mere excuse. They would have noticed that his face was startlingly pale, and that the ordinary composure of his manner was singularly disturbed. Toward evening this restlessness increased, and his old housekeeper, on pressing him to take some nourishment, was astonished to hear him answer her sharply and irritably, for the first time since she had been in his service. A little later her surprise was increased by his sending her with a note to the Ascoli Palace, and by the quick return of an answer, brought ceremoniously by one of Fabio's servants. It is long since he has had any communication with that quarter. Are they going to be friends again? thought the housekeeper as she took the answer upstairs to her master. "'I feel better to-night,' he said as he read it. "'Well enough, indeed, to venture out. If anyone inquires for me, tell them that I am gone to the Ascoli Palace.' Saying this, he walked to the door, then returned, and trying the lock of his cabinet, 
satisfied himself that it was properly secured, then went out. He found Fabio in one of the large drawing rooms of the palace, walking irritably backward and forward, with several little notes crumpled together in his hands, and a plain black domino dress for the masquerade of the ensuing night spread out on one of the tables. "'I was just going to write to you,' said the young man abruptly, "'when I received your letter. You offer me a renewal of our friendship, and I accept the offer. I have no doubt those references of yours, when we last met, to the subject of second marriages, were well meant, but they irritated me, and, speaking under that irritation, I said words that I had better not have spoken. If I pained you, I am sorry for it. Wait, pardon me for one moment. I have not quite done yet. It seems that you are by no means the only person in Pisa to whom the question of my possibly marrying again appears to have presented itself. Ever since it was known that I intended to renew my intercourse with society at the ball tomorrow night, I have been persecuted by anonymous letters, infamous letters, written from some motive which it is impossible for me to understand. I want your advice on the best means of discovering the writers, and I also have a very important question to ask you. But read one of the letters first yourself. Any one will do as a sample of the rest. Fixing his eyes searchingly on the priest, he handed him one of the notes. Still a little paler than usual, Father Rocco sat down by the nearest lamp, and, shading his eyes, read these lines. Count Fabio, it is the common talk of Pisa that you are likely, as a young man left with a motherless child, to marry again. Your having accepted an invitation to the Melanie Palace gives a color of truth to this report. Widowers who are true to the departed do not go among the handsomest single women in a city at a masked ball. Reconsider your determination, and remain at home. I know you, and I knew your wife, and I say to you solemnly, avoid temptation, for you must never marry again. Neglect my advice, and you will repent it to the end of your life. I have reasons for what I say, serious, fatal reasons, which I cannot divulge. If you would let your wife lie easy in her grave, if you would avoid a terrible warning, go not to the mask ball. I ask you, and I ask any man, if that is not infamous, exclaimed Fabio passionately as the priest handed him back the letter. An attempt to work on my fears through the memory of my poor dead wife. An insolent assumption that I want to marry again, when I myself have not even so much as thought of the subject at all. What is the secret object of this letter, and of the rest here that resemble it? Whose interest is it to keep me away from the ball? What is the meaning of such a phrase as, if you would let your wife lie easy in her grave? Have you no advice to give me, no plan to propose for discovering the vile hand that traced these lines? Speak to me. Why in heaven's name don't you speak? The priest leaned his head on his hand and, turning his face from the light as if it dazzled his eyes, replied in his lowest and quietest tones, I cannot speak till I have had time to think. The mystery of that letter is not to be solved in a moment. There are things in it that are enough to perplex and amaze any man. What things? It is impossible for me to go into details, at least at the present moment. You speak with a strange air of secrecy. Have you nothing definite to say, no advice to give me? I should advise you not to go to the ball. You would? Why? If I gave you my reasons, I am afraid I should only be irritating you to no purpose. Father Rocco, neither your words nor your manner satisfy me. You speak in riddles, and you sit there in the dark with your face hidden from me. The priest instantly started up and turned his face to the light. I recommend you to control your temper and to treat me with common courtesy, he said in his quietest, firmest tones, looking at Fabio steadily while he spoke. We will not prolong this interview, 
said the young man calming himself by an evident effort i have one question to ask you and then no more to say the priest bowed his head in token that he was ready to listen he still stood up calm pale and firm in the full light of the lamp it is just possible continued fabio that these letters may refer to some incautious words which my late wife might have spoken i ask you as her spiritual director and as a near relation who enjoyed her confidence if you ever heard her express a wish in the event of my surviving her that i should abstain from marrying again did she never express such a wish to you never but why do you evade my question by asking me another it is impossible for me to reply to your question for what reason because it is impossible for me to give answers which must refer whether they are affirmative or negative to what i have heard in confession we have spoken enough said fabio turning angrily from the priest i expected you to help me in clearing up these mysteries and you do your best to thicken them what your motives are what your conduct means it is impossible for me to know but i say to you what i would say in far other terms if they were here to the villains who have written these letters no menaces no mysteries no conspiracies will prevent me from being at the ball tomorrow i can listen to persuasion but i scorn threats there lies my dress for the masquerade no power on earth shall prevent me from wearing it tomorrow night he pointed as he spoke to the black domino and half mask lying on the table no power on earth repeated father rocco with a smile and an emphasis on the last word superstitious still count fabio do you suspect the powers of the other world of interfering with mortals at masquerades fabio started and turning from the table fixed his eyes intently on the priest's face you suggested just now that we had better not prolong this interview said father rocco still smiling i think you were right if we part at once we may still part friends you have had my advice not to go to the ball and you decline following it i have nothing more to say good night before fabio could utter the angry rejoinder that rose to his lips the door of the room had opened and closed again and the priest was gone end of section 43 recording by warren cotty gurney illinois section 44 of after dark this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by warren cotty gurney illinois after dark by wilkie collins the professor's story of the yellow mask part third chapter three the next night at the time of assembling specified in the invitations to the mask ball fabio was still lingering in his palace and still allowing the black domino to lie untouched and unheeded on his dressing-table this delay was not produced by any change in his resolution to go to the melanie palace his determination to be present at the ball remained unshaken and yet at the last moment he lingered and lingered on without knowing why some strange influence seemed to be keeping him within the walls of his lonely home it was as if the great empty silent palace had almost recovered on that night the charm which it had lost when its mistress died he left his own apartment and went to the bedroom where his infant child lay asleep in her little crib he sat watching her and thinking quietly and tenderly of many past events in his life for a long time then returned to his room a sudden sense of loneliness came upon him after his visit to the child's bedside but he did not attempt to raise his spirits even then by going to the ball he descended instead to his study lighted his reading lamp and then opening a bureau took from one of the drawers in it 
the letter which nanina had written to him this was not the first time that a sudden sense of his solitude had connected itself inexplicably with the remembrance of the work-girl's letter he read it through slowly and when he had done kept it open in his hand i have youth titles wealth he thought to himself sadly everything that is sought after in this world and yet if i try to think of any human being who really and truly loves me i can remember but one the poor faithful girl who wrote these lines old recollections of the first day when he met with nanina of the first sitting she had given him in luca lomi's studio of the first visit to the neat little room in the by-street began to rise more and more vividly in his mind entirely absorbed by them he sat absently drawing with pen and ink on some sheets of letter paper lying under his hand lines and circles and fragments of decorations and vague remembrances of old ideas for statues until the sudden sinking of the flame of his lamp awoke his attention abruptly to present things he looked at his watch it was close on midnight this discovery at last aroused him to the necessity of immediate departure in a few minutes he had put on his domino and mask and was on his way to the ball before he reached the melanie palace the first part of the entertainment had come to an end the toy symphony had been played the grotesque dance performed amid universal laughter and now the guests were for the most part fortifying themselves in the arcadian bowers for new dances in which all persons present were expected to take part the marquis maligny had with characteristic oddity divided his two classical refreshment rooms into what he termed the light and heavy departments fruit pastry sweetmeats salads and harmless drinks were included under the first head and all the stimulating liquors and solid eatables under the last the thirty shepherdesses had been according to the marquis's order equally divided at the outset of the evening between the two rooms but as the company began to crowd more and more resolutely in the direction of the heavy department ten of the shepherdesses attached to the light department were told off to assist in attending on the hungry and thirsty majority of guests who were not to be appeased by pastry and lemonade among the five girls who were left behind in the room for the light refreshments was nanina the stewards soon discovered that the novelty of her situation made her really nervous and he wisely concluded that if he trusted her where the crowd was greatest and the noise loudest she would not only be utterly useless but also very much in the way of her more confident and experienced companions when fabio arrived at the palace the jovial uproar in the heavy department was at its height and several gentlemen fired by the classical costumes of the shepherdesses were beginning to speak latin to them with a thick utterance and a valorous contempt for all restrictions of gender number and case as soon as he could escape from the congratulations on his return to his friends which poured on him from all sides fabio withdrew to seek some quieter room the heat noise and confusion had so bewildered him after the tranquil life he had been leading for many months past that it was quite a relief to stroll through the half-deserted dancing-rooms to the opposite extremity of the great suite of apartments and there to find himself in a second arcadian bower which seemed peaceful enough to deserve its name a few guests were in this room when he first entered it but the distant sound of some first notes of dance music drew them all away after a careless look at the quaint decorations about him he sat down alone on a divan near the door and beginning already to feel the heat and discomfort of his mask took it off he had not removed it more than a moment before he heard a faint cry in the direction of a long refreshment table behind which the five waiting girls were standing he started up directly and could hardly believe his senses when he found himself standing face to face with nanina her cheeks had turned perfectly colorless her astonishment at seeing the young nobleman appeared to have some sensation of terror mingled with it 
the waiting woman who happened to stand by her side instinctively stretched out an arm to support her observing that she caught at the edge of the table as fabio hurried round to get behind it and speak to her when he drew near her head drooped on her breast and she said faintly i never knew you were at pisa i never thought you would be here oh i am true to what i said in my letter though i seem so false to it i want to speak to you about the letter to tell you how carefully i have kept it how often i have read it said fabio she turned away her head and tried hard to repress the tears that would force their way into her eyes we should never have met she said never never have met again before fabio could reply the waiting woman by nanina's side interposed for heaven's sake don't stop speaking to her here she exclaimed impatiently if the steward or one of the upper servants was to come in you would get her into dreadful trouble wait till to-morrow and find some fitter place than this fabio felt the justice of the reproof immediately he tore a leaf out of his pocket-book and wrote on it i must tell you how i honour and thank you for that letter to-morrow ten o'clock the wicket gate at the back of the escoli gardens believe in my truth and honour nanina for i believe implicitly in yours having written these lines he took from among his bunch of watch seals a little key wrapped it up in the note and pressed it into her hand in spite of himself his fingers lingered round hers and he was on the point of speaking to her again when he saw the waiting woman's hand which was just raised to motion him away suddenly drop her colour changed at the same moment and she looked fixedly across the table he turned round immediately and saw a masked woman standing alone in the room dressed entirely in yellow from head to foot she had a yellow hood a yellow half mask with deep fringe hanging down over her mouth and a yellow domino cut at the sleeves and edges into long flame-shaped points which waved backward and forward tremulously in the light air wafted through the doorway the woman's black eyes seemed to gleam with an evil brightness through the sight holes of the mask and a tawny fringe hanging before her mouth fluttered slowly with every breath she drew without a word or a gesture she stood before the table and her gleaming black eyes fixed steadily on fabio the instant he confronted her a sudden chill struck through him as he observed that the yellow of the stranger's domino and mask was of precisely the same shade as the yellow of the hangings and furniture which his wife had chosen after their marriage for the decoration of her favorite sitting-room the yellow mask whispered the waiting girls nervously crowding together behind the table the yellow mask again make her speak ask her to have something this gentleman will ask her speak to her sir do speak to her she glides about in that fearful yellow dress like a ghost fabio looked around mechanically at the girl who was whispering to him he saw at the same time that nanina still kept her head turned away and that she had her handkerchief at her eyes she was evidently struggling yet with the agitation produced by their unexpected meeting and was most probably for that reason the only person in the room not conscious of the presence of the yellow mask speak to her sir do speak to her whispered two of the waiting girls together fabio turned again toward the table the black eyes were still gleaming at him from behind the tawny yellow of the mask he nodded to the girls who had just spoken cast one farewell look at nanina and moved down the room to get round to the side of the table at which the yellow mask was standing step by step as he moved the bright eyes followed him steadily and more steadily their evil light seemed to shine through and through him as he turned the corner of the table and approached the still spectral figure he came close up to the woman but she never moved her eyes never wavered for an instant he stopped and tried to speak but the chill struck through him again an overpowering dread an unutterable loathing seized on him all sense of outer things the whispering of the waiting girls behind the table 
the gentle cadence of the dance music the distant hum of joyous talk suddenly left him he turned away shuddering and quitted the room following the sound of the music and desiring before all things now to join the crowd wherever it was largest he was stopped in one of the smaller apartments by a gentleman who had just risen from the card-table and who held out his hand with the cordiality of an old friend welcome back to the world count fabio he began gaily then suddenly checked himself why you look pale and your hand feels cold not ill i hope no no i have been rather startled i can't say why by a very strangely dressed woman who fairly stared me out of countenance you don't mean the yellow mask yes i do have you seen her everybody has seen her but nobody can make her unmask or get her to speak our host has not the slightest notion who she is and our hostess is horribly frightened at her for my part i think she has given us quite enough of her mystery and her grim dress and if my name instead of being nothing but plain andrea di arbino was marquis melanie i would say to her madam we are here to laugh and amuse ourselves suppose you open your lips and charm us by appearing in a prettier dress during this conversation they had sat down together with their backs toward the door by the side of one of the card tables while diarbino was speaking fabio suddenly felt himself shuddering again and became conscious of a sound of low breathing behind him he turned round instantly and there standing between them and peering down at them was the yellow mask fabio started up and his friend followed his example again the gleaming black eyes rested steadily on the young nobleman's face and again their look chilled him to the heart yellow lady do you know my friend exclaimed diarbino with mock solemnity there was no answer the fatal eyes never moved from fabio's face yellow lady continued the other listen to the music will you dance with me the eyes looked away and the figure glided slowly from the room my dear count said diarbino that woman seems to have quite an effect on you i declare she has left you paler than ever come into the supper-room with me and have some wine you really look as if you wanted it they went at once to the large refreshment room nearly all the guests had by this time begun to dance again they had the whole apartment therefore almost entirely to themselves among the decorations of the room which were not strictly in accordance with genuine arcadian simplicity was a large looking-glass placed over a well-furnished sideboard diarbino led fabio in this direction exchanging greetings as he advanced with the gentleman who stood near the glass looking into it and carelessly fanning himself with his mask my dear friend cried diarbino you are the very man to lead us straight to the best bottle of wine in the palace count fabio let me present to you my intimate and good friend the cavalieri finello with whose family i know you are well acquainted finello the count is a little out of spirits and i have prescribed a good dose of wine i see a whole row of bottles at your side and i leave it to you to apply the remedy glasses there three glasses my lovely shepherdess with the black eyes the three largest you have got the glasses were brought the cavalieri finello chose a particular bottle and filled them all three gentlemen turned round to the sideboard to use it as a table and thus necessarily faced the looking-glass now let us drink the toast of toasts said diarbino finello count fabio the ladies of pisa fabio raised the wine to his lips and was on the point of drinking it when he saw reflected in the glass the figure of the yellow mask the glittering eyes were again fixed on him and the yellow hooded head bowed slowly as if in acknowledgment of the toast he was about to drink for the third time the strange chill seized him and he set down his glass of wine untasted what is the matter asked the arbino have you any dislike count to that particular wine inquired the cavalieri 
the yellow mask whispered fabio the yellow mask again they all three turned round directly toward the door but it was too late the figure had disappeared does any one know who this yellow mask is asked Fenello. one may guess by the walk that the figure is a woman's perhaps it may be the strange color she has chosen for her dress or perhaps her stealthy way of moving from room to room but there is certainly something mysterious and startling about her startling enough as the count would tell you said diarbino the yellow mask has been responsible for his loss of spirits and change of complexion and now she has prevented him even from drinking his wine i can't account for it said fabio looking round him uneasily but this is the third room into which she has followed me the third time she has seemed to fix her eyes on me alone i suppose my nerves are hardly in a fit state yet for masked balls and adventures the sight of her seems to chill me who can she be if she followed me for a fourth time said Fenello, i should insist on her unmasking and suppose she refused asked his friend then i should take her mask off for her it is impossible to do that with a woman said fabio i prefer trying to lose her in the crowd excuse me gentlemen if i leave you to finish the wine and then to meet you if you like in the great ballroom he retired as he spoke put on his mask and joined the dancers immediately taking care to keep always in the most crowded corner of the apartment for some time this plan of action proved successful and he saw no more of the mysterious yellow domino ere long however some new dances were arranged in which the great majority of the persons in the ballroom took part the figures resembling the old english country dances in this respect that the ladies and gentlemen were placed in long rows opposite to each other the sets consisted of about twenty couples each placed sometimes across and sometimes along the apartment and the spectators were all required to move away on either side and range themselves close to the walls as fabio among others complied with this necessity he looked down a row of dancers waiting during the performance of the orchestral prelude and there watching him again from the opposite end of the lane formed by the gentlemen on one side and the ladies on the other he saw the yellow mask he moved abruptly back toward another row of dancers placed at right angles to the first row and there again at the opposite end of the gay lane of brightly dressed figures was the yellow mask he slipped into the middle of the room but it was only to find her occupying his former position near the wall and still in spite of his disguise watching him through row after row of dancers the persecution began to grow intolerable he felt a kind of angry curiosity mingling now with the vague dread that had hitherto oppressed him Finello's advice recurred to his memory and he determined to make the woman unmask at all hazards with this intention he returned to the supper-room in which he had left his friends they were gone probably to the ballroom to look for him plenty of wine was still left on the sideboard and he poured himself out a glass finding that his hand trembled as he did so he drank several more glasses in quick succession to nerve himself for the approaching encounter with the yellow mask while he was drinking he expected every moment to see her in the looking-glass again but she never appeared and yet he felt almost certain that he had detected her gliding out after him when he left the ballroom he thought it possible that she might be waiting for him in one of the smaller apartments and taking off his mask walked through several of them without meeting her until he came to the door of the refreshment room in which nanina and he had recognized each other the waiting woman behind the table who had first spoken to him caught sight of him now and ran round to the door don't come in and speak to nanina again she said mistaking the purpose which had brought him to the door what with frightening her first and making her cry afterward you have rendered her quite unfit for her work the steward is in there at this moment very good-natured 
but not very sober he says she is pale and red-eyed and not fit to be a shepherdess any longer and that as she will not be missed now she may go home if she likes we have got her an old cloak and she is going to try and slip through the rooms unobserved to get downstairs and change her dress don't speak to her pray or you will only make her cry again and what is worse make the steward fancy she stopped at that last word and pointed suddenly over fabio's shoulder the yellow mask she exclaimed oh sir draw her away into the ballroom and give nanina a chance of getting out fabio turned directly and approached the mask who as they looked at each other slowly retreated before him the waiting woman seeing the yellow figure retire hastened back to nanina in the refreshment room slowly the masked woman retreated from one apartment to another till she entered a corridor brilliantly lighted up and beautifully ornamented with flowers on the right hand this corridor led to the ballroom on the left to an antechamber at the head of the palace staircase the yellow mask went on a few paces toward the left then stopped the bright eyes fixed themselves as before on fabio's face but only for a moment he heard a light step behind him and then he saw the eyes move following the direction they took he turned round and discovered nanina wrapped up in the old cloak which was to enable her to get downstairs unobserved oh how can i get out how can i get out cried the girl shrinking back affrightedly as she saw the yellow mask that way said fabio pointing in the direction of the ballroom nobody will notice you in the cloak it will only be thought some new disguise he took her arm as he spoke to reassure her and continued in a whisper don't forget to-morrow at the same moment he felt a hand laid on him it was the hand of the masked woman and it put him back from nanina in spite of himself he trembled at her touch but still retained presence of mind enough to sign to the girl to make her escape with a look of eager inquiry in the direction of the mask and a half-suppressed exclamation of terror she obeyed him and hastened away toward the ballroom we are alone said fabio confronting the gleaming black eyes and reaching out his hand resolutely toward the yellow mask tell me who you are and why you follow me or i will uncover your face and solve the mystery for myself the woman pushed his hand aside and drew back a few paces but never spoke a word he followed her there was not an instant to be lost for just then the sound of footsteps hastily approaching the corridor became audible now or never he whispered to himself and snatched at the mask his arm was again thrust aside but this time the woman raised her disengaged hand at the same moment and removed the yellow mask the lamps shed their soft light full on her face it was the face of his dead wife end of section 44 recording by warren cotty gurney illinois section 45 of after dark this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Warren Cotty, Gurnee, Illinois. After Dark by Wilkie Collins. The Professor's Story of the Yellow Mask. Part Third. Chapter Four. Signor Andrea di Urbino searching vainly through the various rooms in the palace for count fabio d'ascoli and trying as a last resource the corridor leading to the ballroom and grand staircase discovered his friend lying on the floor in a swoon without any living creature near him determining to avoid alarming the guests if possible d'arbino first sought help in the antechamber he found there the marquis's valet assisting the cavalieri finello who was just taking his departure to put on his cloak 
while finello and his friend carried fabio to an open window in the antechamber the valet procured some ice water this simple remedy and the change of atmosphere proved enough to restore the fainting man to his senses but hardly as it seemed to his friends to his former self they noticed a change to blankness and stillness in his face and when he spoke an indescribable alteration in the tone of his voice i found you in a room in the corridor said diarbino what made you faint don't you remember was it the heat fabio waited for a moment painfully collecting his ideas he looked at the valet and finello signed to the man to withdraw was it the heat repeated diarbino no answered fabio in strangely hushed steady tones i have seen the face that was behind the yellow mask well it was the face of my dead wife your dead wife when the mask was removed i saw her face not as i remember it in the pride of her youth and beauty not even as i remember her on her sickbed but as i remember her in her coffin count for god's sake rouse yourself collect your thoughts remember where you are and free your mind of its horrible delusion spare me all remonstrances i am not fit to bear them my life has only one object now the pursuing of this mystery to the end will you help me i am scarcely fit to act for myself he still spoke in the same unnaturally hushed deliberate tones diarbino and finello exchanged glances behind him as he rose from the sofa on which he had hitherto been lying we will help you in everything said diarbino soothingly trust in us to the end what do you wish to do first the figure must have gone through this room let us descend the staircase and ask the servants if they have seen it pass both diarbino and finello remarked that he did not say her they inquired down to the very courtyard not one of the servants had seen the yellow mask the last resource was the porter at the outer gate they applied to him and in answer to their questions he asserted that he had most certainly seen a lady in a yellow domino and mask drive away about half an hour before in a hired coach should you remember the coachman again asked diarbino perfectly he is an old friend of mine and do you know where he lives yes as well as i know where i do any reward you like if you can get somebody to mind your lodge and can take us to that house in a few minutes they were following the porter through the dark silent streets we had better try the stables first said the man my friend the coachman will hardly have had time to do more than set the lady down we shall most likely catch him just putting up his horses the porter turned out to be right on entering the stable yard they found that the empty coach had just driven into it you have been taking home a lady in a yellow domino from the masquerade said diarbino putting some money into the coachman's hand yes sir i was engaged by that lady for the evening engaged to drive her to the ball as well as to drive her home where did you take her from from a very extraordinary place from the gate of the campo santo burial ground during this colloquy finello and diarbino had been standing with fabio between them each giving him an arm the instant the last answer was given he reeled back with a cry of horror where have you taken her to now asked diarbino he looked about him nervously as he put the question and spoke for the first time in a whisper to the campo santo again said the coachman fabio suddenly drew his arms out of the arms of his friends and sank to his knees on the ground hiding his face from some broken ejaculations which escaped him it seemed as if he dreaded that his senses were leaving him and that he was praying to be preserved in his right mind 
why is he so violently agitated said finello eagerly to his friend hush returned the other you heard him say that when he saw the face behind the yellow mask it was the face of his dead wife yes but what then his wife was buried in the campo santo end of section forty five recording by warren cotty gurney illinois section forty six of after dark this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by warren cotty gurney illinois after dark by wilkie collins the professor's story of the yellow mask part third chapter five of all the persons who had been present in any capacity at the marquis malanese ball the earliest riser on the morning after it was nanina the agitation produced by the strange events in which she had been concerned destroyed the very idea of sleep through the hours of darkness she could not even close her eyes and as soon as the new day broke she rose to breathe the early morning air at her window and to think in perfect tranquillity over all that had passed since she entered the melanie palace to wait on the guests at the masquerade on reaching home the previous night all her other sensations had been absorbed in a vague feeling of mingled dread and curiosity produced by the sight of the weird figure in the yellow mask which she had left standing alone with fabio in the palace corridor the morning light however suggested new thoughts she now opened the note which the young nobleman had pressed into her hand and read over and over again the hurried pencil lines scrawled on the paper could there be any harm any forgetfulness of her own duty in using the key enclosed in the note and keeping her appointment in the ascoli gardens at ten o'clock surely not surely the last sentence he had written believe in my truth and honor nanina for i believe implicitly in yours was enough to satisfy her this time that she could not be doing wrong in listening for once to the pleading of her own heart and besides there in her lap lay the key of the wicket gate it was absolutely necessary to use that if only for the purpose of giving it back safely into the hand of its owner as this last thought was passing through her mind and plausibly overcoming any faint doubts and difficulties which she might still have left she was startled by a sudden knocking at the street door and looking out of the window immediately saw a man in livery standing in the street anxiously peering up at the house to see if his knocking had aroused anybody does marta angrisani the sick nurse live here inquired the man as soon as nanina showed herself at the window yes she answered must i call her up is there some person ill call her up directly said the servant she is wanted at the ascoli palace my master count fabio nanina waited to hear no more she flew to the room in which the sick nurse slept and awoke her almost roughly in an instant he is ill she cried breathlessly oh make haste make haste he is ill and he has sent for you marta inquired who had sent for her and on being informed promised to lose no time nanina ran downstairs to tell the servant that the sick nurse was getting on her clothes the man's serious expression when she came close to him terrified her all her usual self-distrust vanished and she entreated him without attempting to conceal her anxiety to tell her particularly what his master's illness was and how it had affected him so suddenly after the ball i know nothing about it answered the man noticing nanina's manner as she put her question with some surprise except that my master was brought home by two gentlemen friends of his about a couple of hours ago in a very sad state 
half out of his mind as it seemed to me i gathered from what was said that he had got a dreadful shock from seeing some woman take off her mask and show her face to him at the ball how that could be i don't in the least understand but i know that when the doctor was sent for he looked very serious and talked about fearing brain fever here the servant stopped for to his astonishment he saw nanina suddenly turn away from him and then heard her crying bitterly as she went back into the house marta angrasani had huddled on her clothes and was looking at herself in the glass to see that she was sufficiently presentable to appear at the palace when she felt two arms flung round her neck and before she could say a word found nanina sobbing on her bosom he is ill he is in danger cried the girl i must go with you to help him you have always been kind to me marta be kinder than ever now take me with you take me with you to the palace you child exclaimed the nurse gently unclasping her arms yes yes if it is only for an hour pleaded nanina if it is only for one little hour every day you have only to say that i am your helper and they would let me in marta i shall break my heart if i can't see him and help him to get well again the nurse still hesitated nanina clasped her round the neck once more and laid her cheek burning hot now though the tears had been streaming down it but an instant before close to the good woman's face i love him marta great as he is i love him with all my heart and soul and strength she went on in quick eager whispering tones and he loves me he would have married me if i had not gone away to save him from it i could keep my love for him a secret while he was well i could stifle it and crush it down and wither it up by absence but now he is ill it gets beyond me i can't master it oh marta don't break my heart by denying me i have suffered so much for his sake that i have earned the right to nurse him marta was not proof against this last appeal she had one great and rare merit for a middle-aged woman she had not forgotten her own youth come child said she soothingly i won't attempt to deny you dry your eyes put on your mantilla and when we get face to face with the doctor try to look as old and ugly as you can if you want to be let into the sick room along with me the ordeal of medical scrutiny was passed more easily than marta angrasani had anticipated it was of great importance in the doctor's opinion that the sick man should see familiar faces at his bedside nanina had only therefore to state that he knew her well and that she had sat to him as a model in the days when he was learning the art of sculpture to be immediately accepted as marta's privileged assistant in the sick room the worst apprehensions felt by the doctor for the patient were soon realized the fever flew to his brain for nearly six weeks he lay prostrate at the mercy of death now raging with the wild strength of delirium and now sunk in the speechless motionless sleepless exhaustion which was his only repose at last the blessed day came when he enjoyed his first sleep and when the doctor began for the first time to talk of the future with hope even then however the same terrible peculiarity marked his light dreams which had previously shown itself in his fierce delirium from the faintly uttered broken phrases which dropped from him when he slept as from the wild words which burst from him when his senses were deranged the one sad discovery inevitably resulted that his mind was still haunted day and night hour after hour by the figure in the yellow mask as his bodily health improved the doctor in attendance on him grew more and more anxious as to the state of his mind there was no appearance of any positive derangement of intellect but there was a mental depression an unaltering invincible prostration produced by his absolute belief in the reality of the dreadful vision that he had seen at the mask ball which suggested to the physician the gravest doubts about the case he saw with dismay that the patient showed no anxiety as he got stronger except on one subject he was eagerly desirous of seeing nanina every day by his bedside 
but as soon as he was assured that his wish should be faithfully complied with he seemed to care for nothing more even when they proposed in the hope of rousing him to an exhibition of something like pleasure that the girl should read to him for an hour every day out of one of his favorite books he only showed a languid satisfaction weeks passed away and still do what they would they could not make him so much as smile one day nanina had begun to read to him as usual but had not proceeded far before marta angrisani informed her that he had fallen into a doze she ceased with a sigh and sat looking at him sadly as he lay near her faint and pale and mournful in his sleep miserably altered from what he was when she first knew him it had been a hard trial to watch by his bedside in the terrible time of his delirium but it was a harder trial still to look at him now and to feel less and less hopeful with each succeeding day while her eyes and thoughts were still compassionately fixed on him the door of the bedroom opened and the doctor came in followed by andrea di arbino whose share in the strange adventure with the yellow mask caused him to feel a special interest in fabio's progress toward recovery asleep i see and sighing in his sleep said the doctor going to the bedside the grand difficulty with him he continued turning to diarbino remains precisely what it was i have hardly left a single means untried of rousing him from that fatal depression yet for the last fortnight he has not advanced a single step it is impossible to shake his conviction of the reality of that face which he saw or rather which he thinks he saw when the yellow mask was removed and as long as he persists in his own shocking view of the case so long he will lie there getting better no doubt as to his body but worse as to his mind i suppose poor fellow he is not in a fit state to be reasoned with on the contrary like all men with a fixed delusion he has plenty of intelligence to appeal to on every point except the one point on which he is wrong i have argued with him vainly by the hour together he possesses unfortunately an acute nervous sensibility and a vivid imagination and besides he has as i suspect been superstitiously brought up as a child it would be probably useless to argue rationally with him on certain spiritual subjects even if his mind was in perfect health he has a good deal of the mystic and the dreamer in his composition and science and logic are but broken reeds to depend upon with men of that kind does he merely listen to you when you reason with him or does he attempt to answer he has only one form of answer and that is unfortunately the most difficult of all to dispose of whenever i try to convince him of his delusion he invariably retorts by asking me for a rational explanation of what happened to him at the mask ball now neither you nor i though we firmly believe that he has been the dupe of some infamous conspiracy have been able as yet to penetrate thoroughly into this mystery of the yellow mask our common sense tells us that he must be wrong in taking his view of it and that we must be right in taking ours but if we could not give him actual tangible proof of that if we can only theorize when he asks us for an explanation it is but too plain in his present condition that every time we remonstrate with him on the subject we only fix him in his delusion more and more firmly it is not for want of perseverance on my part said diarbino after a moment of silence that we are still left in the dark ever since the extraordinary statement of the coachman who drove the woman home i have been inquiring and investigating i have offered the reward of two hundred scudi for the discovery of her i have myself examined the servants at the palace the night watchmen at the campo santo the police books the lists of keepers of hotels and lodging houses to hit on some trace of this woman and i have failed in all directions if my poor friend's perfect recovery does indeed depend on his delusion being combated by actual proof i fear we have but little chance of restoring him so far as i am concerned i confess myself at the end of my resources 
i hope we are not quite conquered yet returned the doctor the proofs we want may turn up when we least expect them it is certainly a miserable case he continued mechanically laying his fingers on the sleeping man's pulse there he lies wanting nothing now but to recover the natural elasticity of his mind and here we stand at his bedside unable to relieve him of the weight that is pressing his faculties down i repeat it signor andrea nothing will rouse him from his delusion that he is the victim of a supernatural interposition but the production of some startling practical proof of his error at present he is in the position of a man who has been imprisoned from his birth in a dark room and who denies the existence of daylight if we cannot open the shutters and show him the sky outside we shall never convert him to a knowledge of the truth saying these words the doctor turned to lead the way out of the room and observed nanina who had moved from the bedside on his entrance standing near the door he stopped to look at her shook his head good-humouredly and called to marta who happened to be occupied in an adjoining room signora marta said the doctor i think you told me some time ago that your pretty and careful little assistant lives in your house pray does she take much walking exercise very little signor dottore she goes home to her sister when she leaves the palace very little walking exercise indeed i thought so her pale cheeks and heavy eyes told me as much now my dear said the doctor addressing nanina you are a very good girl and i am sure you will attend to what i tell you go out every morning before you come here and take a walk in the fresh air you are too young not to suffer by being shut up in close rooms every day unless you get some regular exercise take a good long walk in the morning or you will fall into my hands as a patient and be quite unfit to continue your attendance here now signor andrea i am ready for you mind my child a walk every day in the open air outside the town or you will fall ill take my word for it nanina promised compliance but she spoke rather absently and seemed scarcely conscious of the kind familiarity which marked the doctor's manner the truth was that all her thoughts were occupied with what he had been saying by fabio's bedside she had not lost one word of the conversation while the doctor was talking of his patient and of the conditions on which his recovery depended oh if that proof which would cure him could only be found she thought to herself as she stole back anxiously to the bedside when the room was empty on getting home that day she found a letter waiting for her and was greatly surprised to see that it was written by no less a person than the master sculptor luca lomi it was very short simply informing her that he had just returned to pisa and that he was anxious to know when she could sit to him for a new bust a commission from a rich foreigner at maples nanina debated with herself for a moment whether she should answer the letter in the hardest way to her by writing or in the easiest way in person and decided on going to the studio and telling the master sculptor that it would be impossible for her to serve him as a model at least for some time to come it would have taken her a long hour to say this with due propriety on paper it would only take her a few minutes to say it with her own lips so she put on her mantilla again and departed for the studio on arriving at the gate and ringing the bell a thought suddenly occurred to her which she wondered had not struck her before was it not possible that she might meet father rocco in his brother's workroom it was too late to retreat now but not too late to ask before she entered if the priest was in the studio accordingly when one of the workmen opened the door to her she inquired first very confusedly and anxiously for father rocco hearing that he was not with his brother then she went tranquilly enough to make her apologies to the master sculptor she did not think it necessary to tell him more than that she was now occupied every day by nursing duties in a sick room and that it was consequently out of her power to attend at the studio luca lomi expressed and evidently felt 
great disappointment at her failing him as a model and tried hard to persuade her that she might find time enough if she chose to sit to him as well as to nurse the sick person the more she resisted his arguments and entreaties the more obstinately he reiterated them he was dusting his favorite busts and statues after his long absence with a feather brush when she came in and he continued this occupation all the while he was talking urging a fresh plea to induce the nina to reconsider her refusal to sit at every fresh piece of sculpture he came to and always receiving the same resolute apology from her as she slowly followed him down the studio toward the door arriving thus at the lower end of the room lucas stopped with a fresh argument on his lips before his statue of minerva he had dusted it already but he lovingly returned to dust it again it was his favorite work the only good likeness although it did assume to represent a classical subject of his dead daughter that he possessed he had refused to part with it for madalena's sake and as he now approached it with his brush for the second time he absently ceased speaking and mounted on a stool to look at the face near and blow some specks of dust off the forehead the nina thought this a good opportunity of escaping from further importunities she was on the point of slipping away to the door with a word of farewell when a sudden exclamation from luca lomi arrested her plaster cried the master sculptor looking intently at that part of the hair of the statue which lay lowest on the forehead plaster here he took out his penknife as he spoke and removed a tiny morsel of some white substance from an interstice between two folds of the hair where it touched the face it is plaster he exclaimed excitedly somebody has been taking a cast from the face of my statue he jumped off the stool and looked all round the studio with an expression of suspicious inquiry i must have this cleared up he said my statues were left under rocco's care and he is answerable if there has been any stealing of casts from any one of them i must question him directly nanina seeing that he took no notice of her felt that she might now easily effect her retreat she opened the studio door and repeated for the twentieth time at least that she was sorry she could not sit to him i am sorry too child he said irritably looking about for his hat he found it apparently just as nanina was going out for she heard him call to one of the workmen in the inner studio and order the man to say if anybody wanted him that he had gone to father rocco's lodgings end of section forty six recording by warren cotty gurney illinois